I've been working with local government for the past seven years. Um, I've had some. I've had my own business doing foresight consulting, so coming into local government organisations, helicoptering in, asking provocative questions, getting up people's noses, hopefully starting to shake the thinking up a bit and then running away. So now I'm in the city of Warrandara, coming in, asking awkward questions, getting up people's noses and not being able to run away. So it's been very, very good and I'm having a great time. But the thing that's really got me into the sector as opposed to sitting outside and looking and advising and trying to, to say, you know, these are the things you need to think about, is I really think that the future of local government is absolutely key to the future of Australia. I think this level of government is the level of government that's both got the touch on the community, and I know from my own experience, trying to get innovation going anywhere in the country involves local government. So my view is that we need to change from the inside that we've got there's lots and lots of people doing lots and lots of stuff out there and they always want to talk to us about, it, about their good idea. And it's our level of responsiveness or our level of openness, our level of our ability to give away some of our power, and that's what it comes down to in a lot of cases, are we willing to give away some of our power and give it to people in the community and have them make the decisions about things that are confronting them and will influence the way they live their lives. So that's my upfront stake in the sand. Let's see how we go about bringing you around to seeing how I got there. So as I said, this is my get out of jail free card. Um, absolutely my own, but I am using corporate livery. So the first thing about futures and foresight is the future has arrived. It's just not evenly distributed. So when we talk about climate change, I know there are quite a few rural councils in the room. And of those, you've had floods and fires and droughts and all sorts of other things. So, you know, sitting in comfortable inner Melbourne, where maybe we're not quite as affected, you know, in our faces, the future has definitely arrived. It's just not evenly distributed. So, when we talk about the future, the first thing I did in preparing for this presentation was to have a look back and see what you've actually been talking about. And over the last three to four years, you've been talking about a lot of these things about ageing, about climate, about the virtual world, about security and infrastructure and social media. And, you know, none of this stuff is new. But what I think we're starting to see is it's actually hitting, and it's hitting a lot faster. Because 10 years ago, you could get up and start talking about the future, and you'd have a couple of years to draw your breath to get your head around it before they actually hit. Now it's hitting a lot quicker. So we get talked about, we start seeing things and things then start turning up in our inboxes as you know, ideas and, and ways we might need to, to go in the real world. So that thinking time is much reduced. So one of the things I wanted to offer you this morning was a model, saying another day, another model. But as the future's not real, it doesn't exist, we actually need to have ways of thinking about it to get, to, to get our head around it. So this model is called the Three Horizons model. It's not the McKinsey Three Horizons. When people invent models, they like to call them the same thing as something else, nonetheless. So this model talks about a time horizon from the present to the future. So these could be today, 2050, it doesn't really matter. But there's time, and then there's agreement about how we operate. So the first horizon talks about... The first horizon talks about fading paradigms and technologies talking about those things that we use every day. So the technologies that we're using in our day-to-day -day work that we know all about. And over time they'll fade out. And new technologies that we're only just starting to hear about will take over. Yeah, makes sense? Come on people, work with me. I know you're awake. <laughs> okay, so that's two dimensions. There will be a third. Let's just stick with the two people. My goodness. John? All right, so when we're talking about the third horizon, the thing we need to do is have a think about the future we think is coming towards us. Now, you've heard John's take on what he thinks the future looks like, and I'll give you mine. So I've got three numbers for you, which I think are important. So two degrees Celsius. So that's the number in 2009 that we said was acceptable. After two degrees, and often you hear that the planet's coming to an end. The planet's not coming to an end. Two degrees is a species. Issue. So maybe not species survival, but species survival at 7 billion people. Okay? 
So two degrees is an important number. The next number is 565 gigatons. So that's the number of carbon emissions that we can have to keep us under two degrees Celsius. So that's our budget. The third number is the 2795. So that's the gigatons of carbon that are currently sitting on the balance sheets of publicly listed companies and countries that pull out fossil fuels as part of major parts of their economy. So if it's sitting on the balance sheet of a publicly listed company, they basically got a start. So that's our challenge. So we've got a bit of a problem. So under this, if uh, we do start to get two degrees of warming or more, then cities in particular are going to be a pretty nasty place to live for most of us. Now, I've picked on cities, not because well, we're sitting in one, but not because we actually hit a tipping point last year where more people live in cities than have ever lived in cities before in the whole course of human history. So we're turning into a very urbanised species. So what could this look like? Do we have any of our UK visitors? I have picked on them a little bit. Um, so it could look pretty ugly. And the UK is facing some great big cuts in their public sector job numbers. They're also facing some cuts in their central government funding. And it was the, the point about 2015, leisure centres, museums, theatres, could be a distant memory. That's interesting, because for many people, it's obviously those council-delivered services that make life worth living for a lot of people. So if we're starting to head into a future where those sorts of basic bone services, the things that we take for granted in our very fortunate Western democracy are disappearing, then that's one I'd like to avoid, thank you very much. So that's where I'm starting from. So there's my, oh, there's my third horizon. So then the second horizon is those things that will transition us from the, the present that we're in today to the future, in my case, that I want to avoid tomorrow. So that will give you a flavour of where I'm going with the presentation. So I'm seeing a future that I'm not liking to look on particularly much. So I'm now looking for those sources of hope and inspiration that help me get out of bed in the morning and help me determine where it is that I want to put the energies of my life into. So hence, future of local government. So I know we've got a lot of pressures and John's done a good job of introducing these to you so I won't whack you over the head any more about it. Yes, we've got infrastructure issues at the boundaries of our cities. We've got population changes, especially in Melbourne. We're growing very fast, but also under the NBN as that rolls out. Our rural centres will, are expected to grow quickly as well. You know, we've just got more people that we need to fit in. We've got community expectations are growing. They want us to do more. They expect more. I think much of this is to do with the fact that it's actually costing us more to live. And when I'm shelling out more cash, I actually want to see more bang for my buck. So I think all of this is reasonable, we can, and it's totally expected. And when you talk to people about, you know, why is it that you expect more from us, the answer is, you know, because I do, because I deserve it, because I've worked hard, because it's my society and this is what we should be doing. So you start to hear a lot of shoulds in conversations about the things that should happen. And that's interesting. I always think the shoulds are a good a very good um, indicator of the futures that people want to see have come about. As soon as you hear someone say something should happen, they're actually telling you this is the future that they want. So when you listen to your constituents or you listen to your co-workers or you listen to your councillors, listen for the shoulds because they're very instructive. We've got demographic change, my particular favourite from Pyramid. Oh, we've only got half the year. From pyramid to coffin. So apparently a, a healthy, growing economy needs a much more pyramid-shaped diagram when you've got more people down the bottom supporting the elder, older, elderly people up the top. We're moving to, uh, you know, who said statisticians don't have a sense of humour, to a um, coffin... This is really starting to work. To a coffin um, type of outlook where we actually have more people up the top. We know this. We also know, and those of you in your rural councils know, that a lot of them are moving out into rural areas along the coast and having tree changes coming from their urban areas and wanting the same level of services. And I know having spoken to rural councils, that's a real challenge. 
not a service delivery challenge, it's a managing expectations challenge. And again, we're back to the climate. So 100, 182 weather records broken throughout Australia. <coughs> So what does this mean? This means that there will be policy decisions taken at the federal level and state level that will have to be in, implemented at the local <laughs> level. It will mean that we're going to be managing our waste and our carbon and our environments much, much more carefully than we've ever had to before. It will mean that there are costs to things that there weren't costs to before. So the level of, the level of our world is increasing in complexity. So what are we doing? Well, we're having to increase our rates because in order to deliver all the services and infrastructure improvements and maintenance that we're required to, it's going to cost more. The thing is that people see the consumer price index, sorry, the consumer, it's really not me, I promise. <laughs> the consumer price index moving and see our rates moving much more and that's where a level of expectation comes in. So then you start to see these headlines. And for those of you that, um, like to look at these sorts of things. The leaders collected all of these on one page. So you can go through and read all of the headlines they wrote about the 2011-12 council's budgets. So slugged, jumped, hit, slamming. None of that helps. <coughs> so why does this happen? Well, it happens because we're actually spending more money. So we're having to maintain, maintain services because of cost shifting. We've got landfill limits. We've got carbon tax. We've got population growth. So, I mean, there's good reasons for all of this, but I think, as John mentioned, a lot of times we hide these things under a bushel. And part of, I think, what we need to do is actually start talking about them and start the conversation before the headline comes. So, innovation starts with a story about the future. So, let me tell you about the future that I think I'd like to see come about, the one that I'm actively working towards. So, in the past, we've had government by regulation. Then we started to get a bit of market forces coming in, so user pay, so the market was going to help us um, move our scarce resources around. We're now moving off that a bit and saying, well, actually, the community needs to be involved in this, and they need to be telling us where our money's going to be spent and how we're going to spend it. And they need to understand that the resources are scarce and that we all make these decisions together. And I think, oh, that's fine. All those three things exist and will continue to exist over the next five to ten years. I think there's context. So I think part of the issue that John was talking about with the multiple services raining down from the state government, I think the role for local government is to really start that context situation. Because each of us have very different, even within a local government area, we've got very different contexts. But if we look at local government areas as our unit of analysis, <coughs> Even between local governments, they're different. And that's the conversation we need to be having with state and federal government, because that's the information they don't have. They're not able to get into that context space as much as we can. They don't understand, and they're looking to us. So what are your networks like in the state government? Who are you talking to on the policy space about your particular issues? And how, as a sector, can we build those sorts of relationships? So for me, the new role of councils is to be stewards of the hidden wealth of their neighbourhoods. Because in a world where our economic systems are starting to look a bit shaky, our climate systems are starting to look a bit shaky, I actually think we need to work together. And you're, going to, you're seeing this already. I mean, people are doing it. And they're outrunning government because they're sick of, you know, they're waiting around for the public sector to do something and we're not. So they're off doing it by themselves. So I guess our issue is we either get out of the way and let them go for it, or we try to become relevant and work with them. So you're really starting to see people, I like this one, are you a YIMBY? I think we need a bumper sticker. Yes, in my backyard. Yes. No, you're not going to get a laugh. You're not, you're not giving me anything. <laughs> no, 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 thank you. So I think we are seeing the, um, the volunteering. I, I hear apocryphal stories of council work officers going into communities and saying, we have a problem, and being overwhelmed with volunteers. I look forward to that happening in Burundara. Um, so that there are people out there, and they are out there, and they really want to get involved. So how are we working with them? Um, hacker groups. Anyone here a member of a hacker group? 
Anyone know what I'm talking about? Yay! <laughs> Fantastic. So we've got happy groups. We've got young people, old, old people, um, who are getting together, working with computers, making stuff, working with 3D printers, which is what this is. So 3D printing is the beginning of our consumer-driven um, or consumer-driven design printing revolution, really. So imagine a world where you get on your computer, you decide you're buying a basketball for your son for Christmas, 23rd of December, you're on your computer, you download the design specs and print it in your 3D home printer and away you go. Nice. The technology's here. There's a 12 year old in Burundara at the moment who's printing all sorts of interesting things with it. Um, we've got a lot of repurposing going on. I know there's a lot of vintage. Uh, vintage is the new black. Vintage is a, a fashion trend. We're certainly getting repurposing. So this is taking stuff and using it for other things, reusing it, not throwing it out. So you, all of these things are happening without us doing anything. There's a strong provisioning trend going on. So people growing their own vegetables, save, you know, learning how to preserve. I had to go and hit up my grandmother to learn how to use a fowl as a cola a couple of years ago. She thought it was hilarious. Um, but it's all happening. I mean, these are strong networks of people doing this stuff, and they love it. I bought a Thermomix not long ago. It's a cult, I tell you, it's a cult. But they're all into it. So, you know, I've connected with thousands of people around the world talking about the things I'm particularly interested in and helping me work it out. So if that's happening for me around something that cooks stuff, can you imagine what starts to happen when we talk about local communities how we might make things better for each other and ourselves on the ground. Um, one of the things I think is changing dramatically that will have a huge impact on us is that we're going to start needing to issue licences for landfill mining. So there you go. If I never make another prediction again, that's the one I'm making. Um, so waste has value, basically. So at the moment we're seeing the generation of electricity from our landfills. Have any of you got co-generation plants off landfills? Yeah, yeah. Um, but we're also seeing organisations now are getting licences to do some mining, which I'll talk about in a sec. Is anyone from Hume City Council in the room? Okay. Um, Hume City Council's got this thing called the Business Efficiency Network that I've been on their mailing list now for three or four years. And one of the first pieces of work they did, which I thought was inspired, was they got a load of their manufacturing industries and light industries into a room and got them to sit down and start talking to each other about what the waste from their manufacturing processes were. Because the waste of one process may well be the input into another. So they linked up the output of one industrial process and found it helped people find another person that could use that as the input for their industrial process, hence dropping the costs of both getting those inputs and removing the waste and also keeping it within the local area. Inspired. So this is this idea of industrial ecology. So waste has value. We no longer just chuck it out. We'll actually have to use it and reuse it and find ways of supporting people as they want to do this. The power net of things. Distributed energy generation. How many of you in your planning schemes have got rules about overshadowing for solar panels? Because that's going to become an issue. We're going to have all sorts of household generation on the cards. Solar, wind, geothermal for those of you in rural, rural areas. Possibly not geothermal in city areas. Roadways generation. It's going to be an interesting conversation with Vic Rhodes when we start to talk to them about putting pressure pads under the roads to generate electrical energy. Also, MIT's got a um, proof of concept for using asphalt heating of water in pipes under roads. So what you're seeing is as petrol stays at around $96 a barrel, which it actually hasn't moved much in the last 12 to 18 months, you actually start to see that a lot of this renewable energy becomes more available, more cost effective, which means it's us because a lot of this stuff happens in our areas of influence. Yep? Sorry, just a question. Do you have this um, available? I can make it email? available. Yep, sure. It's 20 minutes, so I probably won't email it, but I'll give it to them. I can take the pictures out. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. So the other thing that's going on is ubiquitous computing. I love this. So just imagine a world 
When you get an SMS from your fridge telling you that it's ordered the milk that you ran out of because your 14 year old, it's happened this morning, um, had wheat fix and has finished it, and it'll be available to you to pick up from Coles on your way home from work this afternoon. Nice. Like it. Imagine a world where you go to the toilet. Sorry, I'm dropping the level of conversation. And your toilet analyses that there's actually something wrong with your urine and lets your doctor know that you need to go and make an appointment to talk to him. <laughs> you like that one? There we go, I've got you. Just had to get into the toilets and I had you. So, I mean, this is here already. Again, I say, say to you, the future has arrived, it's just not evenly distributed. So all of this, none of this is, I'm not making this stuff up. I wish I could, but I'm not. So this all exists. It's just not in our everyday experience of the world as yet. I have to say, before I launch into this, this is one of my circles of hell. I can't think of anything worse, but nonetheless, let me... Into ubiquitous computing around augmented reality. I'm sure most of you or some of you have heard about augmented reality. So this is your... Um, you're wearing your glasses or you've got your smartphone. You hold it up to something and some information pops up about it. Now, I'm all right with when I have control, it's when people start pushing ads into my space telling me that I really need that pair of shoes that's on sale at Wigner as I walk past. I can do without that. But this is um, something that National Geographic did. It's obviously a mock-up, because the level of um, IT infrastructure required to do this isn't quite there yet. But it's a series of apps that are connected to places in the real world. So you can look at this building and you can see that there's a coffee shop and you can look at the bus and see what time the bus turns up. And you can look to see how much our leather costs. So it's linking our IT information or our, our internet information to the real world. Um, interestingly, they did some research. <laughs> you can see my... They did some research about um, surgeons. So they had a surgeon doing some... Uh, surgery with Google Glasses on and they had all of this information turning up in his field of vision about you know, what was seen and what he could see in terms of the arteries and the blood pressure and all the rest of it. And apparently he took the glasses off and refused to do any more because he couldn't concentrate because it actually showed that our, our field of vision, we narrow it the more we concentrate. So there's some issues with augmented reality. But nonetheless, um, again, my 14-year-old tells me that this is now common glass hole. So when you see people walking around the street with their Google glasses on, remember this term. It's a term of endearment, apparently. <laughs> so then we get to big data. So I think this is something we're starting to grapple with. Obviously, cloud comp computing also comes up in this area. This is the idea that we have more information than we've ever had as a species ever, and we're generating more in a year than we're generating in the past 10, or whatever the stats are. It's information. It's not knowledge. It's not wisdom. It's not inspired decision making. But it is information. So the question is, what do we do with it? So who do we give access to? How do we get it to mean something? What data are we collecting and what aren't we collecting? Because obviously, if you're collecting data off smartphones, then you're only collecting data off smartphones. You're not collecting data from all those people that don't have smartphones. So you know, what is that telling us? What are the black spots? What are the things we're missing? But it's certainly big data is one of those, data mining is one of those things that there could be huge amounts of uh, leverage in it for us. Because councils do collect huge amounts of data, as I've discovered. And the data is very, very useful. But how do we use it? So here's an example. So this is Amsterdam. So the Amsterdam Fire Authority worked with local government organisations, worked with roadways, so our equivalent of Vic Roads, worked with their sewerage people, worked with basically anybody who had anything to do with uh, this particular urban area. And they put all the data together in a massive data set and worked out which areas were more prone to get fires. So this green splotchy bit that you can see, that's less prone for fires than the red splotchy bit. So they use the this information to determine where they would put their fire appliances, their staff, what they train their staff in a particular way. So it actually led to a much more efficient use of resources. They cut down travel time, because obviously if you put your appliances where most of your fires are, it takes you less time to get there. So this is a fantastic application of big data. It's useful, it's relevant, it drives change, it drives productivity. It's fantastic. 
they did it by letting their data run free. So they didn't pay, it was an open data project. So whose blood runs cold when I say, open up your data? <laughs> but look, ACT's doing it. Now I'm using, I grew up in Canberra, so I'll give you that piece of information first before we start our Canberra bashing. So I have to say to you, the only thing wrong with Canberra are the federal politicians that you all elect to go to, okay? <laughs> so data ACT is their open hack, open data hack concept. So this was the idea that they let go of their data sets. They made their data sets available to anybody who wanted to have access to them. You can't really see, but there's ACT school location, action time tax actions, the bus company, census of all ACT schools. So all these data sets were available to people who could do whatever they liked with them. So they've turned them into apps, they've turned them into all sorts of mobile bits and pieces, they've got an augmented reality um, application being developed. But the first step was that government, and in this case the ACT government is a local government, government had to let their data run free. They've also got a front end now that they call Canberra Connect. And this is awesome. If you haven't had a look at this, I highly recommend you do so. So you click on one of these buttons, so make a payment, and you go into the next screen that says, which payment would you like to make? So you click on, I'd like to make the rates payment or whatever it happens to be. And this is, how can we help you make that payment? And three clicks and I paid my rates for 12. Obviously I hadn't because I don't own property camera, but three clicks. Absolutely fantastic. So I am a person that does not like standing in queues. If I can help it, I don't like talking to people on the telephone about something I want to do. If you can give me something that allows me to do 90% of what I need to do through a computer, more than happy. And I'm not alone. I'm not Robinson Crusoe on this. So this is them putting a front end on things that already exist. So yes, there were infrastructure costs, but they weren't building huge systems from scratch. They were putting a front end on things they already had. And they've got a Fix My Street app. Have anybody seen that? They've got it over in the UK as well. So, you seen that? Yeah, so if your um, footpath outside your house has got a crack in it, you take a photograph of it and upload it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it's working well? Yeah. Yeah. So everything I hear about it is you know, fantastic because it means we don't have to have people walking the footpaths to check stuff out. If you're actually using your community to tell you where the problems are, and more importantly, or using the smart users from the community to tell you, but more importantly finding out from them which ones are more important because you can actually prioritise on this thing as well. So here we get to my landfill mine. I'm very excited about this because I don't normally make predictions, but I figure I'm pretty safe with this one. Anyway, so landfill mine. There's an organisation in Belgium that's just bought itself a landfill um, from the Belgium state government, in a particular area that I can't pronounce so well. And what they're going to do is rip out the 45% of stuff in the landfill that can be recycled and recycle it and use the other, the balance of it, 55% of it, to generate en energy over the next 20 years. So basically, anyway, the process is that they'll, they'll use it all up, and once that's done, they'll turn it into a park. So 20 years, $280 million project, and they've made it pay. So this isn't government supported. This is the first mess, so we've seen this on a much smaller scale, but this is the first big project we've seen in the world. So, Start designing your landfill mining certificates. The other thing I wanted to bring up was this new forms of currency. So some of you will have heard of Bitcoin because they had a bit of a kerfuffle not, not all that long ago. So virtual currencies. Now when I mentioned this yesterday to a colleague, his eyebrows went somewhere close to the roof. And I'd like you to remember that less than 10 years ago we actually had to sign for everything. And I went and bought something the other day and just waved my credit card in the vague vicinity of a pay pass um, machine and away I went. So the idea of virtual currency actually isn't that far a step from where we are. So Bitcoin is a digital currency, it's a decentralised currency, so it doesn't have um, a central bank attach attached to it, it's simply in a market. So a Bitcoin is worth what somebody's willing to pay for it basically. And so there are quite a few state constituencies, as you can imagine, and federal constituencies that are a bit worried about how this will work with organised crime. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, 
it's an interesting concept. If you travel, you ever travel trying to get you know, currency from one place to the other, it's really very painful and you end up paying quite a big percentage to Visa or somebody else in order to do it. So this is an interesting way of getting around that potentially. Transition towns. Transition towns have got their own currency, in this case the topmost pound, so this is this idea of a local currency, so I can buy something from, you know, I can sell something in my news agency, get a topmost pound and go and buy something from a, the local greengrocer in that currency, but I can't go and use it in Bristol, for instance. So it's that localised currency driving local um, purchasing. But then this one's come up now, time banking. Um, I have had small children and I've been in a situation where often I've needed a babysitter. So funnily enough, the thing I can do in the world is strategic planning. I couldn't actually find somebody that wanted to trade me a strategic planning session for some babysitting. <laughs> I don't know why. While Time Bank would allow me to do my strategic planning, earn my hours, put it in the Time Bank, and then when I needed a babysitter, withdraw my time from that Time Bank and get a babysitter. So it gives us a way of bartering <coughs> our different types of time. And the New South Wales government's got a, a pilot of this out in the western suburbs of Sydney that's going gangbusters, apparently. So that's the uh, URL, so you can have a look at that. So we get down to the three C's. So as I was doing this presentation and you know, talking to people at Burundar and thinking about why I was going to go into local government, these three words keep popping into my head. Collaboration, cooperation and connection. <coughs> So who can we collaborate with and how, we, how do we do it? And the fact is we're going to have to do it. Cooperation between ourselves, within ourselves, whatever the right terminology is, and connections into our community. And for me, this is the nub of it. And it's that exquisitely simple and extremely difficult. Because all of these words, I think, as John said before, all of these things are really easy to say, really easy to say. And we can get into a room, and I've done this many times as a foresight practitioner, and we can imagine fabulous futures, and we can come up with lists of things that we're going to do. And then it gets to the implementation, and that's the part of the arts. So I went looking for places where they're actually doing some of this stuff. So yes, anyone from yes? So YAS had some devastating bushfires in January this year. I don't know if anyone was, knows anyone that lives in that area, but they were absolutely devastating. They demolished every fence just about in the entire local government area. And so the local, go the local council was faced with this enormous challenge of replacing all these fences, because obviously if you haven't got fences, you can't restock. Really so they needed to do it as quickly as possible, and there was no way on earth it was going to happen with the you know, government doing, whether it be local or state. So they actually got in touch with an organisation called Blaze Aid, who is a US-based organisation that fly volunteers in. And so they had volunteers turn up within weeks of the fire. So I heard about this at the start of, in the middle of March, and at that stage they'd been there for seven weeks. So they'd obviously turned up two or three weeks after the fire. And they were living in Bookham, which is just off the Hume Highway. The local area was, the local community was feeding them, but they brought all their own um, RVs and tents and caravans, so they're all living in Bookham and being fed. And by that time in March, they'd actually replaced eight, 80,000, 8,000 kilometres of fencing. 8,000 kilometres. It was a huge amount of fencing in a very short period of time. But the thing that struck me was that it wasn't the fencing that was being valued. It was the trauma counselling that was going on with the fencing. Because as the volunteers were working, the farmers had to work too. So the volunteers don't do it for you, they do it with you. So of course, as you're putting up a fence, what are you doing? You're talking, you're chatting. And so the farmers were, and their families were able to get really amazing trauma counselling very quickly after the traumatic events of that January and replace their fences at the same time. That to me is collaboration, cooperation and connection all rolled into one nice package. And to do that, the council had to throw their hands up and admit they couldn't do it. Yes, they had technical expertise, yes, they had context expertise, but they couldn't do it by themselves. Just about finished. So, 
I think the other thing is that it's this local concept. So globalism. So you've got glass holes, globalism. I'm giving you all these new terms. So globalism is this idea of everything's happening out there in the global world. What is it that we want to use from what's out there in our local area? So think global, act local. You've heard that before. Um, Sorry about that graphic. It's crowdfunding. So crowdfunding for me is one of the, um, a really good example of this. I need to get my stats. So councils are crowdfunding around the world at the moment. So Mansfield <coughs> District Council's just raised £36,000 to install free Wi-Fi in their area because they didn't have the cash to do it and the community needed it. Uh, New York City Council have got a Kickstarter. So Kickstarter is one of the web pages that you can go and do crowdfunding on so you can give your cash and they've been rebuilding restaurants and doing art projects and museum, uh, murals and mosaics at subway stations. But my favourite, I think, is um, Kansas City apparently has the second highest number of fountains in the world. If you take nothing else from what I've been talking about for the last half an hour, take that fact away. And they can't afford to maintain them. So they've got a $250,000 annual budget, but just doing five fountains would cost a million dollars to keep them, to refurbish them. So they've actually started a crowdfunding project to fund each of their fountains. So you can go and own a fountain maintenance schedule if that's what turns you on. But apparently that's working really well. So there's an idea. So rather than going a hand to government and saying, we've got this fantastic idea for some infrastructure, will you give us some money? And government says, nah. And we go, oh, really? Why don't we go and get some money from somebody else? Go and crowdfund some of that stuff. So then we come to the kicker. What does participation, participation mean to you? And I think that's over the next two days the sorts of conversations that we'll be having. Is how much power are we willing to give away? How porous are we willing to be? How participative ourselves? Because we've actually got to participate. It's not about getting the community to do it for us. We've got to get in there and get our hands dirty. So that's my question, is what does participate, participation mean to us? So, the distribution of knowledge is the key contemporary task. Knowledge empowers people. If people know the rules and are seized by art, humour and creativity, they are much more likely to accept change. I think that's awesome. So, given I was navigating, I thought we might need some coordinates. So, LGAs need to work together and work closely with other entities, and I mean anybody and everybody. Context is key for me, so what does your local area need and how do you know? Who have you asked? Are you listening to the loudest voices or have you got everyone on board? We need to manage risk, not make, let it manage us. And the thing I'm finding now I've crossed the great divide is that risk is a major issue. And it's not that we want to get rid of it, because we, we can't, but how do we manage it? How do we deal with uncertainty? How do we engage the political process around it? How do we have the honest conversations about, you know, this may not work, but we're going to try it anyway. I think we need to diversify council, council funding. That's my big one. Uh, open, transparent and participative gov government and work with the dynamics of change, like the ones that I've outlined, <coughs> to support our communities to shape their own destinies. There we go. Any questions?